The Sparks Museum podcast is made possible by a grant from the Nevada Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. The podcast is just one of many new features of the Sparks Heritage Museum. To learn more, check out our social media channels or our website at www.sparksmuseum.org. Hello, and welcome to the Sparks Museum podcast. I'm your host and the media manager for the Sparks Heritage Museum, Jessica Johnson. In 1887, cattleman John Sparks bought 2,500 acres of undeveloped land in South Reno and named it the Alamo out of fondness for the years of his youth he spent as a Texas Ranger. He immediately built a house on the property, which is located near the site of where the Atlantis and its parking lot are standing today. This was no common ranch house. It incorporated elements of architecture from the classical revival and gothic revival styles, rich in decorative detail. After Sparks' death in 1908, it was purchased by cattle rancher William H. Moffat. Over the years, the property decreased in size until 1978, when owners Raul and Leslie Hernandez moved the house and relocated it to its present location in Pleasant Valley off old US 395, where it is still visible from the highway today. Today on the podcast, I speak with Michael Fisher. Mike has had many jobs in his lifetime, but one of his foremost passions is Chautauqua. He has performed as John Sparks for many years and for many different events and speaking engagements, and remains, in my opinion, the foremost expert of John Sparks in our area. On the podcast, he speaks about the history of Honest John, the 10th governor of Nevada for whom the city of Sparks is named. He shares his research he has accumulated over the years regarding this ambitious, important historical figure and his many adventures, as well as his own history as a Chautauquan. Please welcome to the podcast, Michael Fisher. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for being on the Sparks Museum podcast today. It's a pleasure to be here. It's never a pleasure driving through the traffic in Reno and Sparks, though, <laughs> when you're from Gardnerville. Oh, wow. I bet it certainly isn't in that case. So I want to begin with the question I ask all of our guests, which is, what personal connection do you have to the city of Sparks, if any? And I, You provided the question, and I thought, had to think a bit about it. Uh, I was born and raised in Reno in a Reno high kit back when Reno and Sparks and then later Wooster were the only high schools in the area. Mm -hmm. So we were naturally rivals more than friends. Oh, sure thing. Until we got to the university. And much like a lot of Nevada, we became friends. And I had a lot of fraternity brothers, including the past mayor, Gino Martini, who were from Sparks. So I had a lot of connections to Sparks after high school, but before we were kind of on different sides of the road. Wow. Well, we're glad that you're here with us today, that old rivalries can be set aside. (laughs) Very old by now. (laughs) (laughs) So how did it come to pass that you found interest in John Sparks as a subject for Chautauqua? A complicated answer, but I'll try and make it quick. I worked at Dangberg as a cowboy after I was a dentist. Oh, wow. I I worked three days a week as a dentist and three days a week as a cowboy for a man named Dennis Jensen, who was a wonderful cow boss. He could raise cows better than anybody I ever met in my entire life. Uh, At one point in time, he was running his cows up north of Wells, Nevada, which is where John Sparks' original ranch in Nevada was. And I heard stories about him and some of the people that had worked for him. So I just started doing research in the last century, the 1990s, and probably spent five to six years before I ever did a Chautauqua performance. Wow. So how long have you been performing as him? Another thing that, thank you for providing the question, I I had no idea. Uh, I started in spring of 2001. Wow. And have done it pretty much until the pandemic occurred, which, and and two simultaneous things occurred. One was the pandemic, and at the same time, or a little bit previous to that, Nevada Humanities quit the History on the Road program. When they quit the History on the Road program, 
it dried up a lot of funds that small museums like the Sparks Museum used to bring in Chautauquans or lectures. And because of that, uh, it really limited the ability to do the Chautauquas. And I'm not a big promoter of my Chautauqua. People want to hear it. I'm happy to do it, but I'm not trying to make a living doing it. Sure. Now, we have listeners as far away as Belgium. So could you give us, and I know this might be difficult because there is a long history of John Sparks, but could you give us a brief overview as to his history, um, especially given the fact that there might be some listeners who don't know who John Sparks is? Absolutely. Yeah. It's fascinating, man. He did everything you could do in the West. Was what I my if I were to write a book, that's what I would say. He did everything you could do in the West, but he started in Mississippi. He was born in Mississippi. Before he was one year old, his family moved to Arkansas. They were basically new lands farmers. They would break out new lands, farm them until they were exhausted because they didn't rotate crops in those days. Um, we're talking 1843 when he was born. By the time he was 14, they moved to Sparks Crossing in Texas, just outside of Lamb Passes. Uh, he came of age there and served in what they called the Frontier Regiment, protecting the border against the depredations of Native Americans. Um, it's the close of the Civil War. His family was still in Lamb Passes, but he and his brother gathered their cattle and took them to cattle drivers who took those cattle from Texas to Wyoming, later to Montana, places like that. The object being putting a $4 cow into a $40 market. Cows were all over in Texas because they had reproduced during the Civil War and were just brushed up. All you needed to do to go into the cattle business was to have a horse, a saddle, and a rope, which <laughs> is what they did. Yeah. Uh, eventually he worked for small pay for others taking cattle north, learned how to do it with his brother, and he and his brother became very entrepreneurial. They took cattle from that $4 market to the $40 market, parlaying their funds until he had three or four different ranches in Wyoming. Uh, he also brought cattle out to Nevada in 1870, first time he visited Nevada in the area where he, north of Wells, where he would eventually set up. Uh, from there, he became a progenitor of the Wyoming Stock Growers Association, eventually moved his stuff to Nevada, northeastern Nevada, was, again, inordinately successful, had some reversals, but very, very successful as a businessman, while he was in northern Nevada, he also bought a ranch in Reno, which was six miles outside of Reno, but is now the parking lot for the Atlantis. So that shows you how much Reno has grown. It's tr grown tremendously. He also had ground at Mayberry and ground where the Reno Municipal Golf Course is now. Um, so he became basically a land bearer, and he sold out the ranch in Elko County in the early 1900s to his partner, he went into politics in 1902, was elected, started serving in 1903, and died in office in 1908. So he had some financial reversals at the end of his life, but until the very end of his life, and, and there was also a financial panic in 1907, which contributed to those losses. And he went from being a millionaire to being basically broke. He was one of three millionaires in the state of Nevada in 1900, according to the, I believe, the World Almanac, uh, two state or two United States senators and John Sparks, but he pretty much died, almost broke. They had to sell the ranches and various things. His family survived, but I think it broke him as a man. Mm. Wow, what a life! Yeah, oh. he he did everything. Oh. And the thing I neglected to mention, which is most fitting for Sparks, he owned the Wiedekind Mine. Right. And when he owned the Wiedekind Mine, he spent, prior to the financial panic in 1907, he spent over $250,000 buying the mine and building a mill, at which point in time, the Sirargerite or Hornsilver, which is what they were mining, 
was very successful down to a certain level and then evaporated. There was no more. And he had a huge financial stake in a mine. They say a mine's a place you can sink a lot of money into. And he did, and that was also helped cause his financial downfall. Mm, What a shame. Now, we previously had Frank Mullen on the podcast who gave us a, a good overview of what Chautauqua performances entail, um, how you typically structure a performance. You don't necessarily start with, I was born in this day, but what st- what spark stories do you typically tell? Um, how do you typically present your Chautauqua performances? Or does it change depending on <laughs> the audience? Well, first I'd like to give a shout out to Frank Mullen, who is a wonderful Chautauquan and has done a wide variety of characters to be able to, well, Babe Ruth to Henry VIII, I mean, really, <laughs> and be believable in each is really something. It's not Frank Mullen doing those when he's doing them, it's Henry VIII. So a big shout out to his capabilities. I don't believe for John Sparks there's a typical Chautauqua presentation, at least when I did them. Mm. I did a generic one, I believe, which kind of was the, yeah, I was born, we did this and did that, and with insights as to why. But I always tried to tailor it to the audience. And I've spoken to various cattle groups. Sparks was a world-famous Hereford breeder. And Hereford Durham breeder and started with Longhorns coming out of Texas. So he was well-founded in the cattle industry and is still relatively famous in the Hereford industry histories. Uh, Sold cattle as far away as Honolulu, Hawaii. Oh, wow. And Utah. uh, I often shipped cattle to Wyoming for pasture. He, He was an intense cattleman. So if I were speaking to a cattle group, I would tailor it into cattle experiences, going up to Trail Eye, Texas. Imagine going a thousand miles with no 7-Elevens, no convenience stores, no towns. Well, Dodge City toward the end of the trail driving days was there, but they went up out of Texas across what was then Indian Territory, now Oklahoma, hit the Great Bend in what they would have called the Arkansas River, and then headed over into Colorado, and then up into Wyoming. thousand miles, got to take everything with you. Not for the faint of heart. Uh, and made vast amounts of money doing that. So cattle groups, I do that. I Maybe horse groups, I talk about what it was like on a trail drive for a period of time. I always thought it'd be fun to go to the Reno Rodeo Trail Drive where they have... 150 cow boys and 150 cows, so you almost have your own person and say, well, how about taking 10 or maybe 15 people up the trail out of Texas and seeing what you could do with 3,000 of them cows? You might have a different experience. <laughs> and and I, as I played with a bit, I developed an accent. Uh, Sparks' accent is a little bit different because he was in Arkansas for 14 years. He was in Texas. He was in Wyoming. And my wife would say, well, you dropped out of your accent. John, why, why did you do that? And say, well, I must have been living in Nevada at that time. <laughs> so just, you know, it's entertainment basically, but it's entertainment with the purpose of purveying a sense of history. Absolutely. I'm so glad that you brought up the accent because as a performer myself, I'm fascinated by all the efforts that Chautauquans make in order to really embody their character. And in addition to the accent, is there any particular clothing items that you use to make up his outfit? Well, I, yes, I have. They, they say in Texas that everything either stings, stinks, or sticks. <laughs> well, so John Sparks would have ha knee-high almost boots, which he wore over his pants, his pants tucked inside of him so that his pants wouldn't be ripped by the things that stick or inhibited adversely by the things that stink. So, uh, And then I had a pair of pants, which were pretty much normal suspenders, 
a period fashion shirt, which had snaps or buttons up to here and then a collar stay and a tie. And I always wore a diamond stick pin, had a somewhat like a Homburg hat that I would wear, but it had a pencil roll on the outside and they called it a cattleman's special rather than a banker's special. Now, I'm also interested in the research process when it comes to developing these Chautauquas because I know that it can lead you down some very interesting rabbit holes <laughs> in some of the stories of these individuals. And it's also so helpful that there are so many primary sources available where, like, for instance, in the Sparks Museum, we have his dining room table. The Sparks Mansion is still structurally sound and being currently lived in in Pleasant Valley and the Historical Society has his chair. Um, so I want to know, did you have a chance to visit any of these sources that we have in our historical institutions or what sort of research did you embark upon in terms of books or newspaper clippings, things like that? Well, I started in the physical presence of where Sparks was. Uh, although he wasn't in the O'Neill Basin, his ranch was basically 70 miles wide in northeastern Nevada and 150 miles long. It ran into Utah a little, into Idaho some, and covered a great deal of northeastern Nevada. They said it was Connecticut, Delaware, uh, Rhode Island, and half of New Jersey. So three and a half states worth of ranch. And I got to spend time up there. I actually, I've been on the wine cup, which was not what he, the wine cup is a brand that Sparks brought from Wyoming. And the shoe sole is a brand that Sparks brought from Wyoming. So I was on the wine cup ranch by the gamble, spent time in the O'Neill Basin, which is again, not exactly where he was, but similar country. I did the physical research first. I visited uh, the headquarters of the Salmon River Cooperative, which was a Sparks place, and saw a lot of the actual locations. Having done that, I started to become fascinated by the man. And there's a great book called Cattle in the Cold Desert by Baxter Abbott Sparks, who actually came and visited me at my house. We with Dr. Jim Young from the University of Nevada. We spent a wonderful afternoon talking about Sparks and until Baxter passed away was a close friend of mine. And I'm assuming Baxter was a direct descendant? Um, he's like a great, great nephew, but he wrote with Dr. Young, Cattle in the Cold Desert, the book wow. on Sparks. Uh, there's a lot of contemporary newspaper files which <laughs> I started in the day where you actually went through the newspapers on microfilm. Right. And didn't know, you just looked for anything that would be associated and then you would print it. And I have three binders, two which, two of which are about four inches thick and then probably another four inches of material that I just gathered in that manner. Since then, they've come out with optical character scanners uh, readers, OCRs, and it's made the process much easier. I have not done a lot of recent Sparks research because I did it the old-fashioned way where you got up and you were dizzy from having the film go in front of your face. And because of that, I use OCRs all the time now, but I use them for other research. Now, in your research, was there anything that came up that surprised you about John Sparks? I think two things. I, mean, I was always a big Theodore Roosevelt fan. Mm. I think Theodore Roosevelt turned Sparks around and was very nasty to him. Really? And over a mining dispute, mining labor dispute in Goldfield. And uh, Sparks... Uh, they said he died of a broken heart. I don't think he died of a broken heart, but I think he was indeed broken by Theodore Roosevelt's actions. And one of the more fun Chautauquans I ever did when I was head of the Department of Cultural Affairs for the state of Nevada, I was lucky enough to go up and 
Nevada Humanities still put on the Chautauqua Festival at Rancho San Rafael. And Clay Jenkinson was Theodore Roosevelt, and I was, I think it was Clay, I'm pretty sure. Don't don't absolutely quote me on that one. <laughs> there, I'm pretty sure it was Clay, and I was John Sparks. Oh, wow. And I did Sparks before, and I was not nice to Theodore Roosevelt. <laughs> I told him exactly. And Roosevelt came on. He got second billing, uh, <laughs> but he also got the rebuttal time, which I didn't get to have. And so we had a little bit of fun doing that. That was one of the more interesting things. I think Roosevelt was unkind to him. I think Sparks, I wasn't surprised by it, but I think he was a friend of the laboring man, and they painted him as not being that over the Goldfield dispute. And difficult time, you have the financial panic in 1907, the International Workers of the World, and the Western Federation of Miners, opposed by Nixon, Wingfield, and the mine owners. Mm. And it's probably one of those things where there's no absolute right or wrong. Both probably had some wrongs. Both probably had some rights. But Sparks got painted in a very bad brush by that. And it eventually caused his death. I mean, it's December 1907 uh, is when the dispute is. Sparks calls a special session of the legislature. He basically, um, how would you say, makes it through that, gets the Nevada State Police Force enacted, which became the Highway Patrol, and which was a thing that he had to do to please Roosevelt so Roosevelt wouldn't immediately withdraw the federal troops he had put down there from the Presidio in San Francisco. Sparks was debilitated by that. He basically went to California to recover his health after that, had what they called a stroke of paralysis, which was probably a cerebral vascular incident. They brought him back to Reno to heroic crowds, met him at the depot in downtown Reno. They took him out to his ranch, and he died there in May of 1908. So from December 07 to 08, is a very difficult period in his life, including a special session of the legislature. And just as a quick aside, we did a dinner at the governor's with the uh, Governor Bryan, Governor List, and Governor Sparks as a fundraiser for with a dinner for the Dangberg Home Ranch Historic Park. Oh wow! And my favorite line from it was, "Anybody that would." call a special session of the legislature to deal with anything in state government is an absolute fool. And I have to admit I did it. <laughs> and then Governor List said, well, I did it. And Governor Bryan said, I did it. <laughs> and, and, and again, my memory fails me. I'm pretty sure Governor List did. I know Governor Bryan said he did. So we were all fools in the same boat. <laughs> How fun to have those historical interactions with other governors that these people would not have otherwise met and try to posit what their behaviors towards the other ones would be. Well, and it was fun because you had two real governors and one pretend governor that probably has a fairly good background in history. And it was just a fun, fun evening. And they they played along. Their daughters actually were roommates either in college or at graduate school and the the message on the phone was something like, if this is our dad's calling, we're at the library studying. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a fun evening with a lot of inside humor. That's excellent. Now, in your opinion, was there a difference between John Sparks, the man, and John Sparks, the governor? No. I, I think he was just as kind to the laboring man on his ranches as he wanted to be in the political life, uh, he was inordinately honest. I mean, his nickname was Honest John Sparks, but I I just think he was one and the same. What you saw is what you got. Now, I think that it I would be remiss if we did not discuss the fact that Sparks, the city, is uh, named for John Sparks. Um but E.H. Harriman was the original proposition to name this land Harriman, but he did not want the namesake of the territory that would ultimately become Sparks, yet John Sparks was subsequently honored. 
What, if you know, was John Sparks' opinion of this land being named for him? Was he honored by it? Because I have heard conflicting stories of he was kind of indifferent or he was being modestly humble about it, but he really was thrilled about the fact that he was being (laughs) honored in that way. Do you know? I do. Um, New Wadsworth first. Wes Wadsworth, Harriman, and then Sparks. Right. Sparks was asked to come to a meeting in April, April 6th, 1904, of the commercial club in Sparks. And they had run across Harriman not being excited about, and to Harriman's credit, or at least, as a good excuse, there was another place named Harriman, and his Sparks at the time was kind of low and swampy, and he wasn't in love with the location, meaning Harriman. Uh, it since built up and brought to grade for the railroad, not swampy anymore. They asked Sparks to come down and said, we'd like to name it after you, Governor. And he was modest about it. He said, I honestly think that you would do better as being a part of Reno because as a larger city, you would have more influence than being an independent, smaller place. But in my Chautauqua I always would say, but the people of Sparks have always been mildly independent and had their own view of what they wanted, and they wanted their own town not to be part of Reno. So Sparks said at first, no, you should be part of Reno because it'll be a better thing for you. And they insisted that they wanted to be independent, and he said, well, then if if you wish— I would be honored to have it named. And the railroad accepted it within a week. Uh, Within, I think by July, it was incorporated and was the sixth largest city in the state of Nevada. Uh, But the interesting thing that a lot of people don't know, and if you think about 19, for the VNT is still running, and it runs down to Carson City. Well, it runs right through John Sparks Ranch. Mm. So John Sparks is, to my knowledge, the only governor that ever had a picnic for an entire city. He invited the entire city of Sparks. They got on the train at Sparks, transferred at Reno to the VNT, went down to Sparks Ranch, and he cooked his prized Hereford beef and had a picnic for the entire And Sparks was famous for his picnics and his barbecues. But he had a picnic for the entire town of Sparks at his ranch. That's amazing. Put them back on the VNT, back to Reno, back to Sparks. (laughs) So the commercial club insisted he accepted and as a way to honor the people that were honoring him by naming their town, he had the picnic. That's wonderful. And it's kind of a testament to who the man was. I I think he was always a Southern gentleman, except when he didn't want to be. (laughs) And and there were occasions where he didn't want to be. In this day and age of political turmoil, and I'm not going to deal with what we're dealing with here, but the editor of the Reno Evening Gazette wrote unkindly about Samuel Post Davis, who Sparks had appointed to a prominent position in state government. And Sparks, who was mm, 60-some years old at the time, whacked Oscar Morgan with his cane. Morgan left, and Sparks followed him down Center Street from the bar in which they were all drinking to the Reno Evening Gazette offices and continued to thrash him. Oh, my gosh. So, he, 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 he was not afraid, he, even as an older man. He was physically, uh, probably six foot two, uh, physically somewhat intimidating, and having done what he did, pretty tough. 
Now, you mentioned before some of the venues and occasions where you performed your John Sparks Chautauqua. Have you ever performed at, in a venue in Sparks? Yes, actually I have. Uh, and I can't remember what it was for, but one of your former board members, God bless his soul, Fred Horlacher, mm. happened to come to it. And the reason that I am in love with Nevada history was because Fred Horlacher brought history to life at Central Junior High School when I was there prior to, oh gosh, 63, 64, 1960. A wonderful individual, a wonderful historian. And I performed in the amphitheater, and Fred was there, and I dedicated the performance, which is something that Guy Rocha always used to do. I dedicated the performance to him and thanked him personally, which made me feel good about how he had made me an enthusiastic lover of Nevada history. That's wonderful. Now, I know that when you when it comes to these Chautauquas, the attendees and uh, some of the people that you meet along the way as a result of performing as these characters can really make some interesting connections. You m- mentioned Baxter Sparks, and the Sparks Museum has been fortunate enough to be in contact over the years with various descendants of the Sparks family. Have there been any in- interesting connections with people that you have made as a result of performing as John Sparks? Mm, yes, uh, and... Some that I wish I would follow up on more and haven't. I'd love to spend some more time with Dr. Young. Um, He's not out in public as much, but just a tremendous individual and his knowledge of range and the things, how cattle were operated back in the 1890s, 1880s is tremendous. So I could still learn a lot from him. Uh, I had conversations on the phone many times with Leland Sparks, uh, Leland Sparks was John Sparks. Leland Sparks Jr. was John Sparks' grandson. Uh, they eventually donate when Leland passed away. They donated a lot of the Sparks material to special collections at the university with the help of Fred Holabird. Um, so those two, uh, Mary Sparks Matthews, some ladies in Southern Idaho who were related to people that work for Sparks. Uh, it's, if you are interested in history, it just becomes a wide open invitation to talk to people who perhaps generally would not be interested in talking to you because you're talking about something of mutual interest. And who else, if any, historical figures do you research or portray? (laughs) Research is a long list. Oh, sure. (laughs) The, the, I, I portray John Sparks. I portray H.F. Dangberg, Sr., the originator of the Dangberg home ranch and a very, very interesting man who came to Nevada in 1853. So uh, not a lot of primary material, although some pops up every once in a while. I've done a tremendous amount of research on gangsters slash mobsters in Nevada from uh, the early days in Goldfield and Tonopah when those folks actually ended up coming and becoming the driving force in Reno's gaming and divorce industry in the 20s and 30s, especially Bill Graham and Jimmy the Cinch McKay, who were the owners of the bank club where Harris is now, where Harris was, <laughs> the former Harris is now. <laughs> uh, fascinating, very, very influential, very, 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 mm, I don't know what the term would be to politely say they were on the wrong side of the law as often as they were on the correct side of the law, but had tremendous influence in 1930s Reno with law enforcement, and the political apparatus. So another fascinating story. I'm doing the bars of Gardnerville right now. Oh, wow. I don't know how many people lived in Gardnerville in 1903, but it probably, well, Sparks in 1904 had 1,500. Gardnerville maybe had 300. 
had 12 bars. Wow. 12 bars in Gardnerville <laughs> for 500 people. Uh, fascinating. I've nailed down the locations of all but two. It, it's just fascinating research, how they transfer back and forth different people. I'm going to do a walking tour and end up at the J&T, Wansaras and Tronde Basque Restaurant, and have a peek on because that one came from Virginia City in 1896 and had been a saloon and house of ill repute up there. Oh, wow. So <laughs> there's a lot of even fascinating history, even though a lot of the buildings that were there are gone. It will be fun, and the walking tour will be fun, and then the cocktail at the end, or Diet Coke, whatever anybody would, might want, uh, will be fun also. <laughs> That's excellent. Wow. And last but not least, in terms of our questions about John Sparks, if you have one, is there a favorite quote of John Sparks's that you know? You know, I, I was never very good at memorizing and quoting. I'm a much better extemporaneous speaker than I am a reciter. So now I more attitudinal than quote. So I don't really have a Sparks quote or anything that, uh, more quotes about him, mm. you know, when he was in the frontier regiment as commanding officer who he kept in touch with long into the future, uh, said he was a big stout hearted boy who would do any task and basically was good hearted and good natured. I mean, so no, I don't. That's wonderful, though. Um, and I think that that's so fascinating, what you said at the very beginning of this podcast, of the story of John Sparks is the story of the West. He was all over. It includes the westward expansion. It includes cattle herding. It includes mining. and includes politics. Mm -hmm. That is fascinating. And thank you so much for sharing that, some of that history with us. My pleasure. <laughs> now I'm going to end on our big three questions. These are the questions that I ask each and every one of our guests. The first question is, what sparks you about Sparks? What do you think makes it a unique place to live, work, or even just visit? I was always fascinated by the nugget back when it was Dick Graves' nugget and Trader Dick's across the street, they were interesting things to visit. Uh, we spent probably a little time underage in the bars of Sparks when I was in college because of my Sparks fraternity brothers, but that's a story for another day. <laughs> uh, I think the thing that I liked most about Sparks was its humanity, the some places have a feel of uppity, and Sparks was a working man, decent, hardworking people that just were the salt of the earth, as my wife would say. And I, I just enjoyed them, and I loved visiting. I loved the – there was a tremendous spur branding iron display in the nugget when John Esquaga had it, which was on loan from the – School of Agriculture at the University of Nevada and collected by Dr. Fred Anderson, who I, whose son I went to school with. I mean, it, just real connections. I, it's amazing because so many of our guests have said the community, the people, in mm -hmm. an answer to that question. And in hearing what you've shared about John Sparks, it almost feels like that spirit of the man has kind of infused <laughs> into the land in a sense. <laughs> Now, do you have a favorite story or moment from Sparks' history? This could either be a significant historical moment or even a favorite personal memory of an event or something that you witnessed here. Well, I, I was very fortunate to be an honored guest at the Centennial Celebration. Really? I still have, well, <laughs> I felt like an honored guest. I don't know if they would have described me as that. <laughs> but my wife and I, my wife often dressed in period costume to go with me to Chautauquas. And we got a special ride in the parade, got to be the Oak Ridge boys, I remember, and Gino Martini, they were 
there was an evening celebration. It was just fun because we were, if not an integral part of it, we were at least a cog in the wheel of what made the celebration a lot of fun. And that was, that's probably my favorite spark. And, you know, riding in a parade, I've, I've done Dangbergen parades in Gardnerville. I've been a fire department parade in Pomona uh, because of some stuff that we did. But that was one of my favorite memories was being in the parade in Sparks. And the entire, I still have the glasses from the Sparks Centennial Celebration. So, that's yes. amazing. And lastly, since we are a museum with a collections archive and we're presently building a research center, we are passionate about collecting any memorabilia, archive materials, or even just oral histories from people in Sparks and the surrounding Truckee Meadows area. With that in mind, we think that everything is worth preserving. So what do you have or know about that you believe is museum worthy? This could be an item, a story, anything like that. Well, it would be impossible to tell you that because I've spent my life collecting Nevada memorabilia. And be, my mom and I, long, long ago in the 1960s, dug bottles. Oh, wow. And some of them were marked Nevada. And so I have Nevada bottles. I have Nevada agricultural stuff. I have Nevada paper, a lot of Dangberg paper. Consequently, it would be impossible to tell you anything that I had that's actually museum worthy, but they're all important to me. <laughs> it sounds like your home in and of itself is a museum. <laughs> well, I, Governor Gibbons appointed me the director of the Department of Cultural Affairs. And he, he kidded me. He said, you ought to be perfect for a uh, museum director because you like all this stuff and you seem to collect some of it. So <laughs> I don't know that it's a museum, but it has a few things that are similar to what you're describing. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and for sharing with us this amazing history and your own valuable work that you've done as a researcher and performer. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. The Sparks Museum podcast is funded in part by a grant from the Nevada Humanities and the National Endowment for the Humanities. It is produced and recorded at the podcast recording studio at Sparks' own Antspace Coworking Entrepreneurial Hub, a place for entrepreneurs made by entrepreneurs. We really want to get the word out about our brand new audio series, so please spread the word about our new podcast by taking a moment to rate, review, and share this episode. Do you have a favorite story of Sparks that you want to hear on the podcast? Email info at sparksmuseum.org to share any recommendations. We would love to hear from you. We also invite you to visit the Sparks Heritage Museum on 814 Victorian Avenue. The museum is open Tuesdays through Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Please come visit and be a part of our ongoing efforts to tell the Sparks story. We'll see you next time.